Well, we're spending a few weeks here in August uh, in this little series called Church 101, just simply asking the question, what is a biblical church? What is the church according to the Bible? Uh, I mentioned last week that all of us fall into one of three categories. You are either churched, unchurched, or de-churched. And so wherever you find yourself this morning, whichever of those categories best describes you, one way to understand what the church is, is to think about what the church does. And one thing every church in the world does is what we are doing right now this morning. Like every church in the world, wherever it is, whatever continent it's on, whatever culture and civilization it is existing in, every church gathers to worship God, sort of like what we're doing here this morning. All over the world this morning, people are gathering in rooms, large and small, and worshiping God. And so if an unchurched person were to walk into a church, if you're here this morning and you're unchurched and you're just to sort of like sit back and observe and watch what happens here, you would notice, I hope, that some things seem pretty essential to what Christians do when they worship and other things are kind of non-essential, right? So like hopefully you would see, okay, when these people get together, they sing, they pray, they listen to the word of God, there's preaching, there's the Lord's table or maybe baptism. These things seem sort of essential and foundational to what Christians do. Things like screens and microphones and air conditioning, these things are non-essential, right? They're nice to have, but they're not essential to what Christians do when they worship. And that's an important distinction for us to keep in mind so we can make sure that we keep the main thing the main thing. I am thankful for all the technology we have here, but I hope you agree we could worship Jesus just as well without electricity, right? And we have in the history of Coram Deo. We have had services with no electricity. We have had services with no air conditioning. Lots of moments have reinforced to us, oh yeah, there's certain things that are primary when Christians worship. There's a lot of things that are non-essential. Whoa, sorry, um, non-essential. One of my friends recently took over the pastorate of a large church on the East Coast, and for about a decade, this church got in one of those seasons where they were very distracted by non-essential things. So the spiritual life of the church sort of attenuated a little bit, uh, but they had invested hundreds of thousands of dollars in lights and screens and video switchers and cameras and also, wait for it, fog machines. <laughs> because how can you worship Jesus without a fog machine? I mean, seriously. And so, now my friend wasn't the pastor when all those decisions were made, and so he's taken over since, and he's trying to sort of, you know, reform some things in the church. But one of the things we like to do as good friends who love him is just to mock him about the fog machines at his church. And so we have a group text thread and about once a week, somebody posts something on there like, hey, I watched your sermon video. The sermon was good. I feel like the fog was below average. Like we could have had a little better fog in the video. Um, I am preaching at that church next spring. And so I've already begun to tee up my expectations for the fog situation. So I text him and say things like, hey, listen, when I'm there, I want max fog. <laughs> like I want Husker tunnel walk level <laughs> fog. I want to just appear out of a cloud and be like, welcome to, to worship, you know? Um, so it's just fun to sort of tease people and tease some of my friends when, when non-essential things kind of have become primary in a way that they shouldn't. Now, thankfully, um, convictionally at Quorum Day, we do not have fog machines, and I hope you appreciate that. What we do have that I hope you do appreciate is an amazing team of lead worshipers. Uh, we are blessed. And uh, yeah, you please, it's worth celebrating. Our worship culture at Quorum Deo has been shaped by four key leaders, Jared Strzok, David Potter, Micah Bruce, Olivia Grant, and around those four main leaders, dozens of instrumentalists, vocalists, and songwriters who have shaped the culture of worship that we have here. And all of you who serve us in that way, I know a lot of you are out here because there are a few dozen of you who play an instrument 
um, or have written songs or lead us in various ways, thank you. Thanks for how you serve and lead our church in ways that are really beautiful and wonderful. Um, one, of my, one of my favorite things about what God has built here is that historically, as people step in and out of those roles in various seasons of life, um, God raises up others to step in and out of those various roles. And so it's been really fun to see how God has just provided through his people. Like when we planted Providence Church in Austin, Texas back in 2010, uh, we needed to send a worship leader with them. And so Micah Bruce, who was, I don't know, like 20 or 21 at the time, he was like, hey, I'll move to Austin. And so he moved there and led worship at Providence for the first seven years of that church's existence. And then we got him back later in life when he moved back to Omaha. And likewise, when we planted uh, First City Church down in Bellevue a few years ago, we were able to send Eric Goodell, who had been part of our worship team here. And now he is the director of worship at First City and has built an amazing culture of worship there. So it's just really fun to see um, as we try to worship together, the, the people God raises up with beautiful gifts and skills to help serve us in that way. As I mentioned that, I do want to say, by the way, that um, there are some openings, there's some needs right now in particular places like bass and keys and some things like that. And so if you have skills in that area, in the weekly update this week, you'll see an invitation to reach out to Olivia if you'd like to audition for a role. Um, we'd love to put you to work and, and involve you in that aspect of our church. Why, why am I talking then about first fog machines and then uh, music and worship? Well, because what we're going to think about together this morning in this series is simply this truth, that a biblical church is a worshiping church. A biblical church is a worshiping church. That's why wherever you would go in the world this morning, you'd find people gathering and you'd recognize it. It would look similar to this because a biblical church is a worshiping church. Now, the word worship has both a narrower and a broader kind of meaning. So narrowly, when we think of worship, we sometimes think about music or the musical aspect, the singing aspect of worshiping God. But in the broader sense, worship is the act of ascribing worth to something. And so as Mike reminded us in the beginning of this service, everybody worships. Everybody ascribes worth to something in life. And a biblical church is a church that ascribes worth to God, that gives God the glory and the honor that he deserves. And so this morning, we're going to look at a psalm that captures much of the Bible's teaching about worship and sort of condenses it down simply and clearly for us in summary form. And as we do that, I want to invite you to consider your own practice of worship. So as we think about what the Bible says about worship, I want you to invite the Spirit of God to bring conviction to you. When you come here on a Sunday, do you come with the Spirit of this psalm? Where does God's Word here invite you and me to repentance, to faith, to obedience? So hopefully you've got your Bible open still to Psalm 96. If you don't, feel free to open it now. Um, under your seat, if you're using one of those black Bibles, you'll find there it's on page 467. And you'll also see the text on the screens as we go forward. Let's examine together four truths about Christian worship. Here's the first one I want to highlight. Christian worship is active because God is great. Christian worship is active because God is great. Look at Psalm 96, verse 1, and notice the verbs that you see here. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations. As we continue reading in the psalm, you will see verbs like ascribe, bring, tremble, say. What I want you to see is that worship is a very active thing. These are verbs. They have the force of action behind them. They are telling us things we are to do. When Christians gather to worship God, we do things. Christian worship is not like going to a movie. It's not a passive activity. It's active. When we worship, we sing. We bless the name of the Lord. We tell of his salvation. We ascribe glory to him. We bring offerings to him. We say that he reigns. Christian worship is active, and we do these things because God is great. 
Because God is great. He is greatly to be praised, the text tells us here. He's worthy of this kind of activity. Now listen, all of you at some point, I'm sure, have been to a movie that was just average, maybe even below average. I bet you've watched a football game that was below average. In fact, I know you have. Sorry, I just threw that one in there. But listen, and listen, if a, if a movie or a football game is like not great, maybe you do the dishes while you're watching it. You know, or maybe you accomplish other things while it's going on because it's just not worthy of much attention. But when a movie is really compelling, when a football game is really good, you find yourself leaning forward, like your attention is captured by whatever is happening. You find yourself very focused. That's the same thing that's happening in this psalm. Listen, friends, the God of the Bible is not average. He is great. And because he is great, he's greatly to be praised. And the more we see the greatness of God, the more we will be moved to worship him actively and joyfully and intentionally. Psalm 96 is reminding you how great God is. And because God is great, Christian worship is active. Christian worship is about verbs and about activity we do things together when we worship. And so when you show up here on a Sunday, you should show up ready to do things, ready to sing and ready to speak and ready to confess our sins together, ready to pray, ready to rejoice. Sometimes we need to be reminded of that, right? Because I've stood next to some of you during worship and some of you are like, cool, man, this is a good thing going on here. Now, I want to say two things about that. One, hey, sometimes it's a season of life where actually just being in the room is the win for you. And if you're in a season like that, that's fine. Like, I'm glad you're here. But for those of you that like just tend a little bit toward passivity and you tend to sort of be in a room just sort of watching and observing, I want you to let this psalm spur you to activity, to actually singing and speaking and engaging with the people around you because that's what this psalm has in mind, right? There are verbs here for a reason. Because we do things when we worship. Worship is active because God is great. He's worthy of our active engagement. Here's the second thing we see about worship in this psalm. Christian worship is comparative because God is glorious. Catch this in verses 4 and 5. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods for all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols, but the Lord made the heavens. One of the things the scriptures invite us to do is to compare the true God with false gods and to see how much better God is than all the other little g gods in our world and in our lives. In the day Psalm 96 was written, the gods of the people were Baal and Molech and Marduk and Asherah, all these pagan gods of the ancient Near East. In our day, the gods of the peoples are things like money, sex, freedom, autonomy, power, individualism. And what Christian worship does is it sets those gods alongside the true God and says, hey, which of these is better? Who is more glorious? Like when we sing a song like Jesus is better, we're doing what this psalm is doing. We're saying how much better is Christ than all the other things that we could give our lives to? The word for glory in the Bible is a word that means weighty or heavy or substantive. The question this psalm is asking is how weighty is your God? Does whatever's ultimate in your life have the gravity and the substance to really hold things together, to really orient your existence? Listen, a helpful analogy is just to think of your life like a solar system. There's some sun at the center around which everything else orbits, your work and your relationships, your friendships, your hobbies, 
your family, everything else in life orbits around some center. There's something at the center of your life that defines everything else. And the question is, is the thing at the center of your, center of your life, does it have the weight? Does it have the gravitational pull? Does it have the density to hold all of that together and to bring beauty and order and harmony to your life? This text says all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols, or you might even say they are weightless. They're insubstantial. They don't have the mass, the heaviness, the density to hold your life together and to really be the center that you live for. But by contrast, the Lord, the God of the Bible, made the heavens. There is a God who made everything and who has splendor and majesty and strength and beauty. Psalm 96 is reminding you how glorious God is. And because God is glorious, Christian worship is comparative. The Bible invites us to compare God to whatever other gods are around us and say, who's better? So when you show up here on a Sunday, you should show up with a little bit of swagger. Like not in yourself, but in the God that we're coming here to worship. Like we're giving our time and energy to the best God in the world right now. Like this is worth doing. You should come in here going, yeah, heck yeah, we're coming to worship God. Why would we not? Because he's the best God on offer. It's okay to be really excited about who God is and to know that you're coming to give your time and energy and attention to what really matters. And not only should you come with a little bit of confidence, but you should also come ready to confess the false gods that you're prone to worship. Like every week when we come together, we confess our sin because we have all been tempted to give our energy and attention and focus to false gods this week, gods that can't sustain the weight of our affections and attentions. And so in Christian worship regularly, we turn our attention and our affections from idols to God. We confess our false worship and we recenter our lives on the God who's worthy of our best worship who really does deserve our praise. So Christian worship is active because God is great. Christian worship is comparative because God is glorious. Third, notice this, Christian worship is invitational because God is gracious. Look at verses seven through nine. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Notice here we're talking beyond the church to the peoples, the nations, everyone around us. Verse 9 says, tremble before him all the earth. So Christian worship is invitational. It invites the whole world to worship God because God is a gracious God. God is a God who holds his arms wide open to all who will come to him and embrace the provision he has made in Jesus Christ. He wants all nations all peoples everywhere to see his goodness and glory and to come to him in worship. And so when God's people gather, we gather to ascribe to God the glory due his name. Notice that in verse eight. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. In other words, God deserves this. And as we give him the glory he's due, we, we get to invite our neighbors, our friends, our work associates, the world around us, to join us in ascribing glory to God. Because the fact is, everybody's ascribing glory to something. Like something has weight and significance in your life. And so we just can say, hey, God's the one who actually deserves that. God's the one who actually deserves your worship and your attention. So you should be ascribing glory to him. Come sit among us, be here as we give glory to the God who really deserves it. Over the past few decades, there has been heated debate over this question. Is a church service like this meant to edify believers or is it meant to evangelize non-Christians? That is a false choice. Non-Christians are always welcome in Christian worship. The Bible assumes as we worship God, we're 
speaking to the peoples, the nations, the entire city around us. Non-Christians are always welcome here. And we don't change what we do just because they're here. Like we do the same thing we would do anyway. We just worship God and ascribe glory to him. And then we say to our non-Christian friends and neighbors, hey, ascribe to this God glory and strength. This is the God you should be worshiping. And man, you're welcome to come hang out and observe how we ascribe glory to him and hear what he is like and see what he's done in Jesus Christ. Psalm 96 is reminding you that God is gracious and because God is gracious, Christian worship is always invitational. And so when you show up here on a Sunday, you should feel free to invite people to join you. You should have an open invitation to friends, neighbors, people you know to come and be among us. And you should assume that, man, down the row from you is probably someone who's not yet a worshiper of Jesus Christ. And so don't assume that people are Christians. Rather, be curious, ask questions, engage with one another, invite people out for lunch, connect with the people around you. One of the mistakes we make in the church is to just assume the gospel. Just assume, like, if someone's here, they're probably a Christian, they're probably following Jesus, they probably already know what to do here. Let's not assume that. There's all kinds of people among us at all times who are at all places in their journey with God, who have all kinds of questions, and that's part of the joy of Christian worship is getting to meet those people and say, hey, so where are you at? What is it that animates your life? Come worship God with us. By the way, notice this invitation in verse 8, bring an offering and come into his courts. This psalm reminds us that giving is an act of worship. What we do with our money shows what we value. As Jesus said famously, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Now, we say here every week that just as an act of hospitality, we don't take an offering during our worship services. We make that choice intentionally because we realize many people, especially de-churched and unchurched people, just assume that, like, I guess if I come to church, they're going to ask me for money and I feel obligated to give. And so we just take that all away because we don't want that to get in the way of people understanding who Jesus is and what, it really, ma- what really matters for them to consider. But the danger in that practice is that we can disconnect giving from worship. That we can think like worship is what we do in here and then I guess, I guess on the way out or like later this week I'm supposed to give. So I want to remind you, if you're a Christian, as you give, however you do that, you're worshiping. Whether you give on a Sunday morning, whether you give online, whether you give through a bank transfer, whether you give weekly or monthly or annually, however you think about that and do that, The invitation is that, yeah, giving, bringing an offering is part of what worship looks like. And we need to be reminded of that, especially because of our practice here of sort of keeping those things a little bit distinct. So Christian worship is active because God is great. It's comparative because God is glorious. It's invitational because God is gracious. And finally, Christian worship is eschatological because God is good. Now, I know I just dropped a theological word on you. Don't worry. I'm going to explain it. The word eschaton in Greek is the word that refers to the last days, the final days. And so when we say Christian worship is eschatological, what we mean is Christian worship looks ahead to the day of the Lord. Notice how this psalm ends in verse 11. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord, for he comes. For he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. This psalm rejoices that God is coming to judge the earth. This is good news that you should celebrate that Christians everywhere should celebrate, that is good news for the world and for the earth, not just for a few people. Sometimes, especially in the sort of cultural climate that we live in, Christians get uncomfortable talking about judgment or about that final day when we will give account of our lives before God. But you know who's not uncomfortable thinking about final justice? 
people who have suffered great injustice. They long for things to be made right. They long for God to bring retribution and justice. If you have been wronged, if you've been taken advantage of, abused, misused, I have good news for you. The Bible has good news for you. The good news is the Lord comes to judge the earth. And he will judge the world in righteousness and his peoples, or, and the peoples in his faithfulness. And what that means for you is that the harm that you have suffered will be avenged. The evil that's been done to you will be judged. The broken places in your life will be healed. And Christian worship looks forward to that day and says, praise God that justice is coming. Praise God, there's someone who's going to right what's wrong and heal what's broken. That's good news. And that's good news we as Christians anticipate and look forward to and unapologetically say, that day is coming and it's good news for all who have suffered or will suffer. Now, why can we look forward with joy to the day of judgment? Judgment seems like something kind of hard-edged. Why can we look forward and welcome it with joy and anticipation? Well, because the whole message of the gospel, friends, is that Jesus Christ stood in our place and has taken the judgment that we deserve on the cross. I mean, this text says God is coming to judge the earth, and that includes us. Like, nobody gets a pass on that. Not only will he come to judge the wrongs that have been done against us, but also he comes to judge us and the wrongs we've done. We have not worshipped God as we ought. We have not lived as we ought to live. But on the cross, Jesus stood in the place of his people, took on himself the judgment that awaits us, and gave us his righteousness. And because of that, our worship is joyfully happily eschatological. It looks forward to that day because it looks back and says what awaits us on that day fell on Jesus on the cross. And so what we can look forward to is the reconciling of all wrongs and the righting of everything that needs to be righted. And so we have no fear in judgment. We have no shame in judgment. We have no reservations about judgment. The day of the Lord will be a wonderful day. This text says it will be a day when the heavens will be glad, the earth will rejoice, the sea will roar, the trees will sing for joy. All of creation is leaning in, anticipating the day when God makes everything right again. That's good news. Psalm 96 is reminding you that God is a good God who comes to bring justice and to make things right and because God is good, Christian worship is eschatological. It rejoices in the day of the Lord. So listen, as you show up here on a Sunday, you should show up with a sense of anticipation. You should show up leaning forward, anticipating that day. Listen, this is what makes it possible, this aspect of worship is what makes it possible for you to be here and actually feel joy in the gospel even when your life is falling apart. Even when things are really hard, even when you're not in a place where life feels full and happy, this is what makes it possible to still come and be in a room of Christians and celebrate the fact that a day is coming when all will be made right. And so regardless of whether today was a great day for me or a horrible day for me, the good news is I can still anticipate the day that is to come, and that's the story that gives life meaning and makes sense of everything and allows me to live in the tension of a world that's broken and of a life that doesn't live up to what I hope for. Yeah, that's good news. And that's what this psalm wants us to remember, that Christian worship always looks forward to the day of the Lord. And that should be anticipated among us with joy. So listen, a biblical church is a worshiping church. And Psalm 96 shows us what Christian worship should look like. It shows us that Christian worship is active. It involves verbs because God is great. 
Christian worship is comparative. We compare God to false gods. Why? Because God is glorious. Christian worship is invitational because God is gracious. We invite everyone everywhere to worship him. And Christian worship is eschatological because God is good. So I want to make then three points of application for us as we think about what it means for us then to be a church that worships. What does it mean for us to live and worship in light of Psalm 96? Three words of application. First, examine your worship. Why is Psalm 96 in the Bible? Why is this text here? Why does God invite us to read it and hear it and think about it and ponder it? Because it's an invitation to examine our worship. So let me ask you this question. This is the basic question of examining your worship. Why are you here? Are you here primarily for horizontal reasons? Because there's some people you like here because your kids like it here, because it's good to be among a positive community. Those things are all good, but none of them should be the primary reason you're here. The primary reason you should be here is to encounter God and worship him and ascribe to him the glory that he's due. When that is the primary reason we're here, then all the secondary things find their place as well. Of course it's awesome to be among a people that help to encourage us, in a place where we find strength from others, in a place where we can make meaningful relationships, all of that matters. But all of that exists because we're among a people who exist to give God the glory that he's due. So examine your worship. And by the way, you should also ask just, are you a worshiper of God? Like, is he the, the center of your life? Or is there some other God right now that defines your world? And if so, what would it mean for you to come to God in and through Jesus Christ, to become a worshiper of him. So the first thing we should do is examine our worship. Why are you here? Good question to ask. Not a threatening question, not a challenging question, actually a very worshipful question. Second, renew your worship. Here's what I know. When you do this regularly, like when you show up here week after week after week, Worship can become very routine. It can feel kind of ordinary. Going to church can start to feel like this is the thing we do between 11 and 12.30 on a Sunday, right? And we need psalms like this to remind us what worship really is, to jolt us out of that routine and to renew us, to remind us of who it is that we're here to worship. Like, why do we do this? So if you find yourself in a place where worship feels a little stale, where it feels a little bit routine, where it feels like this is just a thing we do, would you see with new eyes this morning your great and glorious and gracious and good God? Remember who it is that we worship. Allow this psalm and its truth to renew why you are here, what it means to be here. Allow them to fill you with fresh joy in the God who has shown you his greatness and his glory and his grace and his goodness. Renew your worship. Some of you even like, you could renew it maybe by moving to a different part of the room. I was teasing people in the first service, like you guys, like when I look out at you, like you, get, you have a place you, you're gonna be. I know where you're gonna be in the room because we just get in those ruts of like, well, this is what we do. Like we sit in this row, we sit in the balcony, we sit in this part of the room. That's great, I'm fine with that. Human beings are creatures of habit. But you know what? If it helps to renew your worship to sit in a totally different spot next week, you have freedom to do that. <laughs> you have permission to sit somewhere else in the room, to meet some different people, mix it up. That's good. But also, at the same time you're thinking about renewing your worship, also I want to encourage you to renew your expectations as well. Here's what I mean. We live in a culture of emotivism. And what emotivism means is we judge the value of something based on how it makes us feel. And so there's sometimes this pressure that like, unless coming to church and worshiping feels like awesome and amazing and like a really elevating experience, unless we feel it, something must be wrong. 
So we load worship up with all this emotional freight. And the reason churches use things like fog machines <laughs> is because they're responding to our desire for it to feel like the best concert we've ever gone to or the best sporting event we've ever been at because there's something about the emotion of those things that feels interesting. I want to remind you, listen, just by being in the room, you're doing something nobody else is doing right now. Like just by being here, you're setting aside time in your calendar to say God is worthy of me being here among his people. Friends, that's an act of worship. So renew your expectations. It's okay if you don't always feel it, if it's not the most awesome thing ever, if going to church isn't the highlight of your calendar every week. Now I hope that eventually maybe it becomes that because God is so glorious to you, but it's also okay if we're just here. That's a good thing. Part of what worship is is just being together with the people of God. And by making this time in your schedule, you are doing something that matters to you and that says something about who God is. So examine your worship, renew your worship. Finally, prepare for worship. Prepare for worship. Worship, especially of the God revealed in Psalm 96 requires some preparation. Like what this means is um, for most of us, Sunday morning actually begins on Saturday night. There are some really awesome nurses and medical professionals in our church who work the night shift. And so I had a nurse grab me a few weeks ago. She was like, hey, I just got off a 12 hour shift. If I fall asleep during your sermon, it's not because I'm uninterested. It's just because I just worked a really long shift. And I was like, that is so awesome. I'm so glad you're here. I'm actually really amazed that you would get off work and come here instead of going home to sleep. But for the rest of you, <laughs> for the rest of you, like, actually go to bed at a reasonable hour on Saturday, right? Like, part of preparing for Sunday is just, like, thinking about how do we show up here in a way where we're ready to engage with God and engage with one another and where the rest of our lives have some sort of guardrails and boundaries to help us prepare for Sunday morning. So as you can avoid it, don't come in here breathless and hurried and frantic. I know there are days like that. We all have them. But man, make it part of your practice and your rhythm to prepare for worship. And to help you prepare for worship, I want to help you understand the pattern that we follow every week. It's not going to surprise you because you're so immersed in it. As soon as I say it, you'll be like, oh, yeah, I see how we do that every week. But I like to use five C words to describe it, all right? Calling, confession, consecration, communion, commission. You don't have to remember any of those. I know that's a lot of words, but I like alliteration. So let me explain to you how worship works. The first thing that happens when, we, when that countdown ends, and by the way, if you've never been here early enough to see the countdown end, just show up a little earlier, like five minutes earlier. But when that countdown ends, the first thing that happens is someone gets up here and reads a call to worship. This is scripture reminding us that we're not just getting together here because we thought it was a good idea, but that it's God who calls us to worship. So we're responding to his word even by gathering. So it starts with calling. Then you notice after a few songs, we always do a confession of sin because as sinners called into the presence of God, we need to confess our sins. We need to acknowledge our shortcomings and receive God's grace. The third element is consecration. God setting us apart as his people. And what is it that sets us apart? What is it that makes us distinct? Well, it's the fact that we are submitted to the word of God. And so as we sing scriptural songs, and as we hear the word read and preached, we're submitting ourselves to God's word and we're being set apart and consecrated as his, as his people. And then finally, or fourthly, communion. We come to the Lord's table and we commune with him in fellowship. Having been set apart by him, having confessed our sins, we now come and enjoy fellowship with him at his table. And at the end of our service, we are commissioned, we're sent to go out of here and to live another week of life in the world as his people. And so in calling, in confession, in consecration, in communion, and in commission, we're working through that same pattern every Sunday. 
There are different songs, there are different scriptures, there are different prayers, there are different confessions, but that's always the flow that we're following. Why? Because that's what it means to worship God. It means worshiping in response to his call. It means worshiping as people who acknowledge we need to confess our sin and humble ourselves before him. It means being set apart by his word as people who live according to his word and who live under the authority of his word. It means communing with him at his table. And it means reminding or being reminded that until that last day, we go back out in the world as his people. And so having now been consecrated or set apart by the word of God, let's pray together and let's come to commune with him at his table. Our God, we profess this morning with new joy and resolve that the gods of the peoples are worthless idols, but you, the Lord, made the heavens. So we worship you for your splendor and majesty and your strength and your beauty. We want to ascribe to you the glory that you are rightly due. We know that we don't make you anything you're not by worshiping you. We just respond to who you actually are. So thank you that we get the joy this morning of coming together, of being set apart under your word, and of responding to you, giving you the glory that you deserve. For any among us this morning who haven't yet bowed the knee to you, who aren't yet worshipers of you, would you draw them in to see how beautiful and glorious you are? Father, even for those of us who have come to you in faith and yet are prone to chase after other things, remind us this morning that no God compares to you. There is no other God that can bring the beauty and the glory and the meaning and the purpose in our lives that you can bring. And so as we come to your table now, draw us into deeper fellowship with you. Connect us to your living presence among us through bread and wine. And renew us as we go back out to live another week in the world for your glory. Make us better worshipers and fuller worshipers and deeper worshipers as a result of hearing your word this morning. We pray this for our good and for your glory. Amen.